Joy of the Lord is our strength. That when you decide to be joyful, you are strong. Think of how you feel when this is the way you're talking. How you doing? Well, under the circumstances. No, the joy of the Lord. Well, Randall, I'm not the kind of person that's going to fake stuff. Okay, well, then just stay like you are. But there's a priming of the pump that you decide, you know what? I'm going to have a good day. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have a good week. And I'm going to have a good month and a year. And, and you know what? I've decided I'm going to have a good rest of my life. I'm just planning on it. I'm just planning on it. Yeah, but Randall, what they say they're doing. and they're... None of these things move me. That's a good scripture to write down and look up later. Acts 20, verse 24. Acts 20 and verse 24. When you hear what they're doing... I want you to say what Paul said. None of these things move me. None of these things move me. Because unquestionably, the world that we live in is going to try to move you. Forget the world, your computer. You open your laptop and you log on. To, it's going to try to move you. But when you decide that you're a man of God, when you're a woman of God, and you know where your strength lies, where your hope lies. It doesn't matter what who says, doesn't say what agency says, who's in office, not in office. None of these things move me. I'm standing on the word. I'm not standing on circumstances. I'm not. So in this house, you feel the, 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 the strength that comes because the joy and this is a house of miracles. Amen. They didn't just sing the song just because, well, that's a good song that people sing right now. That is a proclamation. Yes. That's right. This is a house of miracles. That in this place, that the healing flow goes from this house. We started on that last night about what is going, going to continue to happen in this place. When people need a miracle, this is where they come. And they get their miracle, and they don't go, well, every, you know, every six weeks I need a miracle, and i got to go get another miracle. No, you get a miracle, you become a miracle, and you dispense miracles. Then wherever you go, you become, you become a miracle machine. That when people need a miracle, they go up and they, they push miracles. Things just happen because you carry miracles. That's the, that's the whole gospel message, y'all. Right. The whole gospel is not, well, we all got to then make our pilgrimage to go and, and see the empty tomb. And we've got to, we, uh, that's great. It's phenomenal. All that stuff. But Jesus died so there would be little Christs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ooh, some of us don't like that. Brother. No, Christians, Christians, that we carry the same thing that he carried. Kurt said it in worship. We will do the things that he did and even greater works than these shall we do because he's gone to the Father. So we started last night talking about healing and, and, and that this is the place where healing flows from there. If you'll turn in your Bible, I want you to see it for yourself so you understand what's, what is taking place now and will take place going forward. Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel 47. The focus on healing and the miraculous really began to get re-stirred up in me. I have three generations behind me of ministers that... I said last night, I'm rereading my grandfather's book of the origins of our family and, and the healings that took place. My grandpa went after World War II and went over into Europe to help uh, evangelize the displaced persons camps of all of the people that were displaced by the war through you know, their towns being bombed and their, you know, their places of work decimated. They didn't have anywhere to go, anything to do. And so my grandfather was there ministering in those camps of the um, largely Slavic uh, population and a lot of Germans as well. But that, and miracles would follow. Healings would follow. 
One, I remember one specific miracle of, of my grandfather was getting ready to leave this camp and go to the next one and, and one of the, the um, little girls came and, and was, was shaking him and said, come, my, my, brother, my brother is turning blue. And it, was a, and it was a small child. And my grandpa went and prayed for the little boy and his name escapes me, but I remember that, that it, it was a different name. Prayed for the little boy, the little boy just immediately was healed. And then later came and settled in, a, in America in the Boston area and raised a family and so forth. What if my grandpa didn't believe in miracles? What if my grandpa wasn't a, 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 a miracle dispenser? Would that family of that little boy been able to come and live and settle in Boston? See, a lot of times we just think, we just, we do isolated thoughts about miracles. Like, well, I'm glad they're feeling better. I love the, the testimonial that Hannah shared with me last night. That how many years ago, when she was 11 years old, and she had asthma, and had a tough time breathing, and she got healed. And then was able to, before, couldn't, couldn't run, right, without asthma attacks and so forth, but then was able to play soccer and all the things and never have trouble with that again about 15 16 years ago to be I was really I honestly Hannah that really that really impacted me because to think of the kind of life that we can live I mean the the little boy in Germany Hannah's like your life is drastically different when God touches you yeah. and there is a mark and it's it's just different it's different from there if he does it for you then you, you go around and you're not at the mercy of somebody with an argument. Well, brother, those things died out with the apostles. And one day we'll all be healed when we get to heaven and it'll all be wonderful. Yes, heaven will be wonderful. But life and life more abundantly is for while we're here. Yeah. And healing. And so when you're carrying an experience of the touch of God in your life, whether it's, whether it's a miraculous healing whether it's a miraculous provision, whether it's promotion that comes into your life, whether it's whatever it may be, when you're carrying those experiences, you're never at the mercy of someone with just an argument. Yeah. Well, I don't believe it happens. Well, you can believe that all you want there, Holmes, but it's happened to me. When I was a little kid, the same thing happened that my grandfather prayed for, for that little boy that would stop breathing and turn blue. When I was a little boy, I had, I had breathing problems, and just as a little infant in the crib, my mom and dad had to watch me at night to make sure my chest would rise and fall as I was sleeping. And if it, if it stopped, and I would stop breathing and turn blue, they would do the very tried and true medical method of pick me up and smack me on the back. <laughs> I'd start breathing again. So that was, that, was, that was it back in the 60s. That was the extent of, of the health care program. Smack the kid on the back and he'll start breathing again. But one night my dad had the midnight watch and was just walking back and forth in my bedroom in front of the crib just watching me and praying. And he said, God, I'm asking you to heal my son. Heal him of this breathing problem. But even if you don't, I'll still never stop preaching that you're a healing Jesus. Amen. Well, God healed me that night. I never had that trouble anymore. And I don't turn blue anymore. But you know what's interesting to me about that? And I'm going to get into this in a minute. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to introduce... Uh, seven statements to stand on for your healing. I don't know if we'll get through all of them. We'll probably run into tonight. But the enemy of your soul, the one who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, John chapter 10 and verse 10, the enemy of your soul attacks areas of your effectiveness. As a baby, he attacked my breath. Because I don't, I don't, I really don't believe the devil knows everything about your life, but they can sense, they see, they respond to what they see. So he was trying to snuff out my breath because he knew one day my breath would communicate to people all over the world. 
and be able to preach the gospel and bring people and bring healing to people. I just, so think about areas where the enemy attacks you, you're going to have, as we said last night, the situation is a setup. It's a setup for a super testimonial that you'll be able to tell people, like we just said, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not crossing my fingers hoping it's happened. It has happened to me. And I am now a carrier of that. Ezekiel 47. I suppose I should turn there too. What do you think? It's probably not a bad idea, Randall, if you're going to read it. Ezekiel 47. Verse 1. If you haven't found it by now, you're not going to find it. <laughs> then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. And the water was flowing, everybody say flowing, flowing, from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running, say running, out on the right side. Verse 3, and when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me to the and returned me. He brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. It goes down, skip down to verse 9. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. And it goes on and talks about how on the banks of that river, trees grow. It's lined with trees. And that every month, Pastor Al, every month, those trees bear fruit. A whole new crop, one translation says, every month. Renewal. Perpetual harvest. Every month. Think about that. A tree that produces a whole new crop every month? Probably not going to be lacking much. That's over in abundance. That's, that's where healing and provision and breaking through to new levels of not just always needing a breakthrough, whether it's healing, always needing a breakthrough in finances. No, when healing flows, it makes provision for having been healed, stay healed, and be a healer, and breaks you into a level of of living in prosperity. Perpetual. The first verse of scripture I ever memorized, my parents paid me cold, hard cash when I was like five or six years old to memorize Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, who does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sit, I feel like I'm on a re, at a recital. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaf does not wither, he bears fruit in due season, and whatsoever he does prospers. How does that happen? By losing death words... And loosing life. Yes. Meditating on the word of God. Allowing this to permeate our spirit. Just as, uh, as, as Pastor Al was saying about how in, in days gone by they would teach for weeks on end about healing. And then lay hands. Why? Because our minds have been so permeated with the messages that surround us in our world. That sometimes we get into a groove with that and we don't even realize it. That we're thinking contrary to what, the, what we say we believe. That's right. That's right. Hmm. right. So, the prompting of this and the stirring it up in me, that history that I have, and mentoring, traveling with healing ministry for over a quarter of a century, I've seen a lot of healing. And then I've also noticed in the past, I don't know how many years, across this country, that healthcare is the focus everywhere we go. 
all the gleaming new buildings and everything everywhere you go. Whoa, that's a beautiful building. What is it? Oh, health care. What's that? Oh, it's health care. Oh, that's health care. Health care. But I'm one of those people that believes that I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. You don't know it to look at me, but I'm an alien. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. We're thinking that. Like, I was wondering. I was wondering. Any other aliens in the building? Just, Just passing through. Keep on trucking. Remember that old, that 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 old picture of the guy walking like this with his foot that's as big as he is. We're just passing through. So no matter what everyone wants to tell us that health care is the way of everything, I don't subscribe to the Earth's health care. Heaven's health care. I want you to say, say that. Say heaven's health care. <laughs> Zero deductible. <laughs> Zero copay. <laughs> Office visits are free. <laughs> you don't have to make an appointment. He's available 24-7. The doctor will see you now. It's true. Well, I need to make an appointment. You know what? I'm going to make, I'm going to have my appointment right now. So we're losing death. We're breaking some of our mindsets that maybe we hadn't even noticed had fallen in line with the pattern of the world. Because Romans 12, 2 is one of the more effective things that we can find, that don't be conformed, but be transformed. So a few foundational verses, as I said last night, John 10:10. 10, 10, there's a thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life, and life more abundantly. More and better life than you've ever dreamed of to the full till it overflows. That's the kind of life. Not the steal, kill, and destroy. As a, as a personal coach, I have a lot of uh, private clients that I meet with on a weekly and bi-weekly basis with folks. Some that are saved, some that are not saved, some that are on their way to being saved. When I get to work with them, as a, 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 I have a background and in, in license in, in drug and alcohol counseling. I've worked with, with help people walk out of crisis and into a better life. Breaking bad habits and building better ones to make life a dream come true. People from all kinds of places. If you're interested in something like that, see me after. We can talk about it because I coach people from everywhere. But walking with people and helping them understand what's going on in our lives, if it's ugly, if it's hurtful, if it's painful, if it's destructive, what category does that fall under? And I asked them the question very simply. Does that sound more like the stealing, killing, and destroying side of life? Or does that sound like more than enough, more than I can think, want, or begin to imagine kind of life? And if it's demonic, if it's, if it's destroying, if it's hurtful, we know where it comes from. Why would God do this to me? Wait a minute. Let's, let's check our categories again. It's pretty simple. Does it hurt? Is it painful? Is it destructive? Is it, is it causing you issues? Then, that, why God, why? No, no, no. No, no, no. One of the first statements is this. Okay, I told you I'm going to give you seven statements to stand on for healing. The first statement is this. Write this down. If you don't have any paper, write it on your hand. I, I kid you not, I was speaking recently and I, I said, and I've been saying this for years, some of you need to write it down, some of you need to get it tattooed on your, somewhere. And I was doing a, a, a two week healing meeting and I, I kept teaching about, I can't not prosper. I can't not prosper because healing and prosperity go together, they're hand in hand, hand in glove. I can't not prosper. One of the guys in there got it so in him the next day he comes in and he says, he says, I imagine you working with rock and rollers and stuff. You've seen a lot of ink and people have tattoos and stuff. I said, yeah. He's, he said, 
He said, yeah. He said, I got a new one. You, you did? What is it? And he holds his arm out. I can't not prosper. <laughs> he had heard it the day before. It so hit him, he tattooed it on his arm. He literally went that night and got a tattoo. So I don't know if you want to tattoo this one on your arm. It's kind of, no. Nah. But, but here it is. Here's, here's statement number one. Sickness is satanic. We're not talking about joining a coven and standing around in hoods. No, I'm just telling you, satanic has other realms. Sickness is satanic. Randall, no. Well, God made Job sick. Randall? No. No. That's an argument that you hear a lot. Well, God made Job sick. Like, I'm sorry you bought a Bible that was on discount because mine, <laughs> mine says in Job 2, verse 7, that Satan went out from the presence of God and afflicted Job. It's very plain. It's very clear. Job 2, 7. So the sickness is satanic. Just say it again. Say sickness is satanic. <laughs> that understanding that the way we live our lives is a lot of times we get into a mindset that of a certain age, then certain things have to start happening. <laughs> it's programmed. Well, men of a certain age, are you da 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 Yeah. How'd you know? Well, we get programmed with, well, it runs in your family. Well, it just runs in my family. I guess, you know, my dad had it, and I'm going to have it. Sickness is satanic. I want us to stop thinking of healing and wholeness, as we said last night, as a birthday present or a nice Christmas present that comes around every now and then, and start thinking of healing instead as the sun rises. Did the sun rise today? Yes. Healing is here. Yes. Wholeness is here. Yes. But the enemy wants to get us into that system. I, for one, have decided I am not born to be an asset to the pharmaceutical complex. Amen. I do not exist to line the pockets of health care in America. Come on. Some of you are still figuring this out. I, I, sickness is satanic. Say it again. Sickness is satanic. Look, look at the story. You don't have, have to look there. Just write it down, write the reference. The woman that Jesus came upon in the temple, Luke chapter 13. Luke 13, he came up to a woman who was bent double for 18 years. She could not straighten up. And he came in and he said she was bent over not by anything other than a spirit of infirmity. A spirit of infirmity. And he said, you are, you know what, let's look at it. Look, look over there, Luke 13. Let's just read the story. Because sometimes it really sticks that much better in you when you look at it in your own Bible. Luke 13. <clears throat> no, exactly. Not a discount Bible, one that holds all these stories. Say it again. Say, sickness is satanic. Luke 13, verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. And was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Verse 13, And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them. And not on the Sabbath day. 
Oh, did I do that out loud? Yeah. Because that's exactly what it sounds like. Some penny any religious minded ridiculousness. Well, why don't you, why don't you come and get healed on the set? Well, what else am I going to come, you moron? Why can't I come on the Sabbath and get healed? Give me a freaking break. Jeez. I just, Jesus had such a problem with the religious people, and I do too. Drives me bananas. <laughs> Righteous indignation is what that's called. So then the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite. See, I love the way he handled them. He just called it straight out like it is. Hypocrite. In front of the whole congregation. Hypocrite. Does not each one. See, I, you, you don't know it, but we're breaking mindsets. When, I, when we're talking like this, we're breaking us out of things that maybe we didn't even know we were in a rut on. In a, in a, in a ditch on our thinking. And, and Hypocrite. Does not one... Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. Think of it. Jesus pauses right in the middle of what he's saying. He says, think of it, whom Satan has bound. So when I say sickness is satanic, Jesus then emphasizes it right there. The being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. For 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. Good. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. When he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitudes rejoiced. <coughs> He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Spirit is saying to the church in this hour, you are the river of healing. Yes. You are where healing flows from. Heaven's health care does not just trickle out the door, but there is an increasing of the river of healing that's flowing. And this church is going to be consistently growing in that realm. That healing will flow from the house of God. You know how one of the main ways that the river will flow? Everybody do this. And do this. Through you. That everywhere you go. That you dispense healing. That everybody that comes into your office. For some reason. Amy's just. With her touch. is just healing. Everybody who interacts with you, for some reason, they feel lighter. Why do they keep coming to your office and sit down? Why do they keep coming and sitting here? Because there's healing in your office. Because your interaction with the favorite checker that you go to at Family Fair, that you always talk with her, that you're, there's healing flowing through your conversation. And they're likely going to see your billboard of having been healed. Before they ever come through the doorways. We advertise it. But sickness is satanic. It's not something that we just, well, yeah, you know, I'm getting old now. You know those things that happen to you? How old are you? 36. <laughs> 36 years old. No, I have reserved for me, I just, I just turned 53 three weeks ago, and I have reserved being old for my mid-90s. I'm not going to be old until then. How can you say that? Glad you asked. Turn to Joshua 14. <clears throat> As you turn and say it, say, sickness is satanic. I'll give you the next phrase off of sickness is satanic. The next statement to stand on is healing is heavenly. 
Healing is heavenly. Joshua 14. You may have heard of these guys, a guy named Joshua and a guy named Caleb. Yeah. Say it, say sickness is satanic. Healing is heavenly. You know, it says in uh, one of my favorite Psalms is uh, Psalm 103. And I love you get to, I think, verse 3. It says, who heals all your diseases. He crowns you with love and compassion. He heals all your diseases. Healing is heavenly. Here's a great example of you are to live a long and strong life. Okay, here it is. Joshua 14, verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly, how did they make it melt? With fear. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, 85 years old, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. Forty-five years later, I'm as strong at 85 as I was at 40. Still going out and fighting, strong going out, strong coming in. Strong going out, strong coming in. Well, no, strong. All the days of your life. Turn to Psalm 91. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? Psalm 91. Start with the last verse. Verse 16, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. All the days of our lives, sickness is satanic, healing is heavenly. You do not, I do not, as a man who names Jesus as my Savior, as a woman, you name Jesus as your Savior. You can, at 85, be as strong as you were at 40. Well, I don't believe that. Well, then be decrepit. <laughs> I'm sorry for you, but it's right there in the Word. So many of us ha are, uh, we, yeah, well, yeah, the Bible, it is a good book, and, well, it's nice, and, and it sits on our shelf open, and just sits, and it sits there. And yet we sit in our own prison. There was a lady in... I believe it was in Philadelphia, and, or I'm sorry, it wasn't Philadelphia, it was actually England, and she hadn't been coming to church, she was older, in older age, and Charles Spurgeon was her pastor. Charles Spurgeon came to visit her because he hadn't seen her in a while, she was sitting in her home there, and he just talking about how, oh, and she didn't have any money, and he had actually brought her food and stuff from the church because she was in a rough way. And she was just going on about her aches and pains and not having this and that. And she was, I, I forget what age, but she was up, up in age. And as she was talking, Charles Spurgeon uh, 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 framed, 
thing on the wall caught his eye as she was talking. And as she's talking, sitting there talking, saying about how she can't get around as much and not having money for food and all this sort of stuff, he walks up to that, that framed piece of whatever it was and takes it off the wall and says, he says, have you, have you looked at this? Have you read this? She said, I can't read. She said, I'm, I'm illiterate. I never, never did learn to read. And he said, do you mind if I take this for a couple of days? And she said, no, that, that's fine. He said, I just want to ha have something looked at. So he took that framed parchment off the wall and took it to his lawyers and found out that this woman had been a caretaker for a man who had passed away. And that framed thing on the wall was him bequeathing his entire estate to her and it was just sitting up on the wall that changed her situation in a moment a lot of us have this sitting up on our wall that if we would just take it down and we're sitting uh, in certain areas of our lives we're in prison and this is hanging on our wall and someone walks by like me and says you know that thing on your wall you could take that out and unlock the prison door and walk across the street to the all-inclusive all whole all prosperous all everything that you ever need just by this because the scripture doesn't say that my people are destroyed for lack of a good feeding program. My people are destroyed for lack of a real good worship leader. My people are destroyed for lack of small group attendance. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 verse 6. If your Bible's not on discount, it will, it, it, it will have that in there. See, because where the enemy of our soul traffics is in the dark. And I don't just mean the dark of night. I mean the darkness of ignorance. And I'm not saying dumb. I'm just saying you didn't know. If you didn't know, you didn't know. Just like that woman sitting in her house in not enough money for food, but yet she owns an estate. The same kind of thing in your life. Jesus did not die and go through a brutal, torturous death so that we can barely get by. So that we can tolerate sickness. So that we can go, well, it runs in my family. It is of the devil. A spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And Jesus pauses and says, think of it. Think about it. Any of this sickness that has tried to engulf the globe, you don't have to have it. Amen. This hanging on your wall or sitting on your shelf. Let's, let, let's read this. this the, Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I can imagine un abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. That's a pretty good spot to be in. That's a cool sitting back in a hammock with a little umbrella in your drink and a cool breeze blowing over you when the water is coming in, lapping at your that's That's the way I fix it. It's abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, verse 2, He is my refuge. And my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. Surely, everybody say surely. surely. Not surely, surely. Surely. <laughs> surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. That's like uh, Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy. No, surely goodness, not surely goodness. Not, not a lady named Shirley goodness. Um... <laughs> Uh, surely, surely he shall. Everybody say he shall. He shall. 
He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Why would he if it was sent from God? Why would this promise be in there of all the things that he'll do for it if we're supposed to stay sick? If we're supposed to uh, just learn to live with it. Not the way I read this. Not the way I understand it. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Verse 5. You circle that, highlight it, point arrows to it, put stars around it. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. I want you to, I, I'm a big fan of, of not generalizing scripture, but personalizing it. Okay, so we just read it, you shall not be afraid. And it's like, that's great, that's great to read it. You shall not be afraid. I want you to personalize it. I shall not be afraid. Say it again, say, I shall not be afraid. One of the main things, one of the main spirits that has been loosed in this world and has stepped up on a world stage like never before is the, the uh, spirit of fear. Yeah. Anxiety. And that it has announced itself and says essentially everything that you hear is now fear this, now fear this, now fear this, now fear this. I remember seeing something a few years ago that said, it had a, had a story about somebody whose um, uh, wireless headphones had, you know, exploded, it said, on an airplane. And so then now it says, be very aware of this. Now your headphones could explode. It's like, really, one more thing that, like, what? They had a battery that leaked. So now I'm supposed to now fear this? I like everything. Fear, 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 fear. Do you know that fear is a magnet for everything the devil wants to bring into the life? Well, I, you know, I, 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 during COVID, I'm just going to, you know, I, I'm afraid to go out. Yeah, you should be because you probably get it. Because fear is a magnet for everything un, unholy and unhealthy. Just smile at me like I'm your friend. Your mama prayed I would talk to you this way. Just it's good. A coach, sometimes a coach has to push you a little bit. Say, I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste in noonday. What's he saying? Morning, noon, and night. You do not have to fear. Talk back to things that tell you to fear. Say, nope, not me. I remember years ago being at my mom and dad's house in, in Saginaw and I forget what was going on in the world, but the, the headline of the Saginaw News newspaper, remember those newspapers? The headline on the top of it in those big block letters, Pastor Alice said, forecast gloomy. <laughs> and I picked it up and I said, and I said to my mom and dad, and I said, not for us. Come on. Not for me, not for you. My forecast is not gloomy. I don't take that. As a matter of fact, I put it under my feet. Because the devil is not eye to eye. He's not over my head. He's under my feet. You got to talk back to him. Sickness is satanic. Well, you need, to, you need to understand that, you know, when you get to a certain age, you're going to have to get this prescription, and then you're going to have to uh, get this other prescription to counteract the effects of that prescription, and then you're going to have to do this for the rest of your life. Sometimes it's too easy for us because of our health care benefits. Instead of asking the Lord, we, call, we start Googling WebMD. What is it? And it's going to tell you, yeah, you, oh boy, you better run to the emergency room right away. I'm telling you, you can get healed, stay healed, and be a healer. Yes. This beautiful parchment that is hanging on your walls, on your shelf, unlocks the estate of God to you. The estate of God is a one of health and healing and wholeness and provision, promotion, protection, prosperity, 
Read on. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. But it shall not come near you. Amen. That's right. Amen. Just that one alone, y'all. A thousand may fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand. But it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked. Oh, see what I've done? I've gone into personalizing it the way I read a lot of the time scripture. Because I have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, my dwelling place, no evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over me to keep me in all of my ways. In their hands they shall bear me up, lest I dash my foot against a stone. I shall tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent. I shall trample underfoot. Because I have set my love upon him, therefore he will deliver me. He will set me on high because I know his name. I shall call upon him and he will answer me. He will be with me in trouble. He will deliver me and honor me with long life. I will be satisfied and see his salvation. Sickness is satanic. I said sickness is sickness is satanic. Healing is heavenly. You have the ability to live long and strong. Amen. By the mere fact that you're in the house of the Lord today, you can never go out and go, well, I didn't know. Yeah. Now you know. Yeah, right. I know you've heard it before. This is a healing house. You've heard those sorts of things. But carrying ourselves, one of the things when you start to think of it in that terminology that sickness is satanic and healing is hev heavenly, it develops in you an urgency and a righteous indignation for anything or anyone that tries to tell you different. That's right. You're like, That's right. Mm, no, right. no, I'm not. They start sending, you know, AARP at a certain age and you need to, and it's, a, it's actually a catalog of, of all kinds of sicknesses that you're going to have to start tolerating at a certain age. I mean, literally, it is. Oh, yeah, well, you need to get yourself checked out for this. Throw it in the fire. You need a good fire today. It's cold out. Throw it in the fire. And say, not this house. Call them up and say, don't send that crud to my house anymore. I'll tell you a story about that. A friend of mine, his, uh, his uh, grandmother lived with them growing up. And he and his grandma became really good friends. And they were just like buddies. And he started noticing that at a certain time of, of uh, each month that his grandma would be bummed out. And she was normally a very happy person, very just jovial and, and he's a joker and she was a joker and they would always be teasing back and forth to each other and he noticed that she would start getting bummed out and then he found out that it was right around the time that each month the AARP magazine arrived. Because she would then look through it and see all the things and she would start feeling like this is my destiny. He called up AARP and said, don't ever send that here again. Can I ask why? No, you may not. Don't ever send it here again. And God bless AARP, whatever. I'm not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just giving you an illustration I know from my life, I'm from a, a friend. I'm not, and you are not, an asset for pharmaceuticals. I'm an asset for the kingdom of God. Amen. I'm an ambassador for the kingdom of God, and so are you. One of the things that I think that we forget as I start to bring this plane in for a landing, I could keep you here until 4 o'clock next Thursday. <laughs> that we have to recognize is the responsibility that we have as children of God. Did you just cuss in church, Randall? Responsibility? <laughs> the responsibility that you have as a woman of God to carry the message of God yes. to demonstrate to our generation Lord save the world Lord save Michigan it's not going to happen that way yeah, that's right. it's going to happen through you yes. it's going to happen through me that we carry and take it as a personal responsibility that our neighbors need to hear and see Jesus in our lives. 
that our family needs to see the billboard of better life that we are, that we demonstrate life and life more abundantly, that we carry the responsibility. Now, not, Lord, what can you do for me today? It's not the way it works. Lord, what can I do for you today? Why did you design me? Why did you bring me to this world? What, what am I here for? What on earth am I here for? The greatest selling book, nonfiction book of all time, besides this book, is The Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> Nearly 40 million copies of The Purpose Driven Life. What on earth am I here for? The first sentence of the book, it's not about you. <laughs> and that's where a generation of in entitlement goes, well, yes, it absolutely is certainly about me. It's about thee. Lord, what do you want to do? And you know what happens? That the, the enemy has sold us this lie that we've got to beat our chest and say it's all about me. But what happens when you say it's all about thee, that's where you find fulfillment. That's where you find contribution. That's where you find all the basic human needs that humanity needs by serving the cause. When David came up to the armies that were at a standstill against the Philistines because they had a big tall guy that was saying stuff. You may have heard of him. His name was Goliath. And David said to his brothers, Is there not a cause? In his righteous indignation, everyone else that was like, he, hi, He's so big. Oh, he's just mean the way he talks. Did you hear the way he talked to me? <laughs> and David, his little teenage self, walks up and goes, with a fire in his eyes, goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's saying these things against the armies of the living God? Why are you guys cowering over here in fear? Stand up. I can't. I'll do it. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. Some of us, the giant of fear in our lives has been intimidating too long. It's time for us to stand up and say, Lord, what do you want to do through me? I know you've empowered me, and the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I choose to not go out into the world with a mean look on my face, but to be a good billboard for better life and show everybody what it looks like to have a connection to God and that life can change and life can be better and life can be joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full of glory, full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory and the half has never yet been told. But that's the way we live. Healing comes. How many of you feel better now at this point of the day than you did earlier today? Yeah. Before you, can, you come into the house of God and what's happening? You're getting all wet. <laughs> you just the river's flowing. The river's flowing. Just put your hands in the air. I like to say it's the international sign of surrender. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, just pray in, pray in your heavenly language. If you pray in English, just thank God out of your mouth. Lord, I thank you for touching me. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you that I'm not the same that I was. I'm not the same man. I'm not the same woman. You're changing me. I thank you that you're molding me and making me and shaping me into the man, the woman that you have made me to be. Lord, we thank you. Just keep praying in the Holy Ghost. Rumu bore te tia ha satara katai tatara bokoto. Parra mama ma shatara barra katatara bakondo. Runzendara bakar kete shitere ke seka la katara katai. Dovrenda and dandaro burra bakala baharra bahototo. Rumu burri shitiria basara barra bahaha ha 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 ha
Kori meneni mendim bendara dara baka remene shete asai Gora mandan dan dara bafafa Hori meneni ambakan dara basoko toto Rumo bobo shoto roboko tarabatai Ramanandan dara bakonto Ramondon dara bakon dara bashatai Hannah, will you get on the keyboard, please? Just, just Hannah, just play, but just keep praying. Aramasa tarabara makatai, klori menanandan darabatatai. As you continue praying, God's given, given you ideas. This is a place uh, as heavens open, ideas are coming. Situations that have looked unresolvable are, are uh, you're finding resolve. That He's dropping things in your spirit right now, right now. Thank you, Lord. Continue praying in the spirit. Press in just for just for a couple more minutes. Just just let the power of the presence of Almighty God. I thank you that you're breaking us out of the old. You're breaking us out of the old and into the new. You're breaking us out of the old and into the new. You're breaking us out of the old and into the new. You're breaking us out of the old and into the new. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you the, for the truth of your word. That the trickling is rising. That where there have been little hints of the flow of God in our lives, I thank you for the, the rising waters. That just like a dish that sits in the, in the sink that has dried on food on it, it's hard to get that stuff off. But as it soaks... It just slides right off. So I thank you for the renewing in our minds today. It started last night. It is this morning. We'll go into tonight. That old things are passing away and all things are becoming new. You're breathing. Your breath into our lives. The dry bones are rattling. That what has felt dead has felt like a thing of the past. You're breathing life. We prophesy to those things. Prophesy to the dry bones. I want you to begin to do that right now. Whatever has been dead and dry and you're looking for something to change, you tell it right now. In, in this atmosphere, in the presence of God, you tell that. Whether it's a relationship that has, has a, has a, is broken, that doesn't look like it can be healed. Whether it's a physical condition you've dealt with. You say, in Jesus' name, live. In Jesus' name, live. In Jesus' name, be restored. In Jesus' name, promotion. In Jesus' name, needs met. In Jesus' name, live. 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 But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. In Hastings. In Michigan. And to the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall carry my name, my word, and my healing to your neighborhood, to your workplace, to your family, to your friends. You shall be healed, you'll be whole, and be healers. Some of you right now in your, in your mindset, just keep your eyes closed. In your mindset, God is, is renewing 
thought processes that maybe you had accepted, God's suggesting new, 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 new. That is permeated by the blood of Jesus, permeated by the river of healing, permeated by more than enough kind of thinking, permeated by he is your provider, he is your promoter, he is your protector, that you shall not fear. Jesus. There's a couple of you that you've battled self-hatred and kicked around suicide from time to time. I break that spirit in the name of Jesus. If that's you, you just write at your seat. I break that spirit of suicide and self-hatred in the name of Jesus. You just say it. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to run around the building or make a show of it. You just tell it because you have authority. He's given you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you, including self-hatred and suicide. Depression. We break your hold in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for freedom. That where there has been a depressive state that's kept kept us at a certain level that the cap is being taken off to elevate and go forward thank you Jesus thank you Jesus with heads bowed and eyes closed if you're in here today and you are away from God maybe you've never had a relationship with him or I don't know, I used to have a relationship with God, Randall, but things happened, and you know, I don't really... If that's you, and you say, yeah, I, I, I know I'm not where I need to be with God, will you just lift your hand? I want to pray with you and for you. If that's you, you say, I need to come back to God. Let's see two hands. Anybody else? Say, yes, I need to come back to Jesus. Two of you that lifted your hand, if you'll just pray this with me. If you didn't lift your hand and you need to pray it, pray it with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I need you. Jesus, I thank you for what you did for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I choose you. I know you chose me first. But now I'm choosing you because I want to live for you and I want to see you use my life. Say, break off all the old and let me step into the new. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, make sure you tell someone that you rededicated your life to Jesus today.